This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. Welcome to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio, where each week we talk to a different creative Mississippian. I'm your host, Leslie Barker, Arts-Based Community Development Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today I'm speaking with Executive Director of the Walter Anderson Museum, Julian Rankin. Julian is a writer, photographer, and graphic designer himself. And not only will we, will we be talking about his work, his work at the Walter Anderson Museum, but we also will be talking about Art Museum Month, Mississippi. So you don't want to miss this. How are you doing, Julian? Thanks so much for being here. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. Awesome. Well, so there's something really exciting happening. We're just going to jump right in. We're going to talk all about, you know, everything that you do, but we're just going to jump right into this Art Museum Month, Mississippi. Um, What's that all about? So as you know well, and as everyone hopefully listening knows, you know, Mississippi is all about collaboration and culture. And so this really emerged as a result of of many conversations between institutions and, and museums across the state. And with support from the Mississippi Arts Commission as well, we wanted to, as a collective, offer free admission for the month of August as a thank you in part to our communities who have stood by us during this difficult year and a half, um, but also just a way to get folks um, reacquainted with all the different hidden gems around the state. So this is again, a consortium of museums and and other institutions. So down here on the coast, obviously the Walter Anderson Museum of Arts is a participant and the Oro O'Keefe Museum of Art, but you can go up to Laurel and go to the Lauren Rogers Museum, or you can be in the Delta and go to Delta State, the Matthew Sanders Sculpture Garden, or even the Museum of the Mississippi Delta in Greenwood. I'm also in Meridian, the Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience is participating. And of course in Jackson, the Mississippi Museum of Art. So like I said, um, the Mississippi Arts Commission helping fuel this and then Visit Mississippi is a, a critical partner as well. So folks for the entire month of August can go online to visitmississippi.org slash art museums, get a, a promo code email sent to you and, and start to travel the state and, and rediscover what makes Mississippi so great. You know, that's something I've found really exciting about this project is not only is it about going to see you know whatever is in a museum in your hometown but also traveling and and there's a whole lot about traveling so um talk a little bit about the travel aspect of this and what you know made that exciting well i think you know another campaign brand that we uh, sort of overarching brand is the art of travel and for anyone who Uh, knows anything about the South, that's one of the great things about where we live, and especially in this state, is you can hop in your car and and start to drive. You don't really need a destination. You're going to encounter something interesting. You might find, you know, a a bluesman playing on a porch Mm -hmm. in Bentonia, or if you go north, you know, you'll just stumble upon some amazing, um, you know, structures or institutions or green spaces, and everywhere you go is is something different. And Mississippi has such a, a unique regional identity within the state, so the landscapes change. And we're fortunate again to have the coast and the delta, and you know, the pines and all the rest. And so I think part of of, of this initiative too was to be true to that. And you know, personally, I think back to you know my childhood, but also going back and revisiting the Mississippi Delta a lot and. One of the things I find so compelling about that place is even in this day and age of 5G, there's something about the Delta where your cell phone never quite works. You really need an analog Mm -hmm. old fashioned map. And and that's something that is is true for um, for the history of the state. And I think very much uh, kind of a romantic notion of get in your car. You don't have to leave Mississippi to find a whole new adventure. You know. You, you've really touched on this, and this is one of my favorite things about working at the Arts Commission is not only does Mississippi have its character as a whole, but it's the regions are so distinctly different. I mean, you know, you can you find so so many different things throughout the state. So you've lived in different places. Tell us about, you know, some of the places you've lived in Mississippi. Yeah, well, I started in the Mississippi Delta as a young child outside of Cleveland, a little blink and you'll miss it town called Shaw, Mississippi, and um, really charmed, interesting upbringing across the street from a cotton gin and uh, really came to know what Mississippi was through that lens. And then later, um, you know, when I got started grade school, moved to Oxford, Mississippi. And of course, 
a wonderful cultural bastion there. Grew up in a, a even more charm childhood when you know John Grisham's still living there and writing, and you know Willie Morris and Barry Hanna and Faulkner and Larry Brown. Mm-hmm. That all that that legacy is in square books, and, you know, tying it all together. So. Um, that was an amazing place to grow up. And I moved away afterwards uh, to North Carolina for high school, college, came back and spent a lot of time after college in Jackson at the Mississippi Museum of Art. And now I'm here on the coast. And so I've lived in almost every region, not quite every one, but I've traveled to all of them. And they really are unique places, but they're knit together with this shared cultural identity. And again, that's what this initiative is about. And that's what Mississippi art is about. Absolutely. And you know, I love talking to to artists about how this state, this place has, has, you know, fostered their work as an artist, has turned them into an artist. And, you know, you've lived in places that are um, so rooted in music and words and, and art in so many ways. How do you think, you know, some of your early experiences in those places led you to a life in the arts? It was definitely instrumental. Again, Growing up in the Delta, the most Southern place on earth, as James Cobb has coined it, you know, you can't be from a, you know, a more culturally significant place than that. And I was fortunate to have parents who were participants in the cultural life of the state, a father who's a photographer and folklorist, and then in Oxford as well, being around an institution at the University of Mississippi and the people who worked there at the Center for the Study of Southern Culture, who were my neighbors, and all this stuff was, was just so accessible. Um, and so really, I think what it did was it, it grounded me in place, which is where all good art comes from, whether mm-hmm. that's Welty or Natasha Trethaway or whomever you might name. Um, but also it gave me a proximity to see that these creative exploits, these wonderful works of literature and art were made by real people. And so that mm-hmm. the humanist view of, of where art comes from, if you combine place with people and you're able to uh, to approach these folks and places like Square Books or Lemuria, if we're talking about literature, they bring mm-hmm. in these people who um, who are real flesh and blood. I think that's where it all began. And then, of course, like any artist or writer, you have to find your own voice. And, and that was part of my my growing up and, and working and failing and, and rewriting and all the rest. But but it was it was grounded and, and core um, with that idea that Mississippi is a place that that springs forth. Oh, absolutely. I'm Leslie Barker with the Mississippi Arts Commission, and today I'm talking with Julian Rankin, and we're going to talk a little bit about your work in Ocean Springs. So, so you're the executive director of the Walter Anderson Museum of Art. Um, tell us about that museum. If you've never if you've never heard of Walter Anderson or you've never been to the museum, what can you expect? Well, it's ever changing, but there's certainly a a, a certain uh, timelessness to it as well. This is our 30th anniversary. So the Walter Anderson Museum of Art, of course, here in downtown Ocean Springs is really a jewel box museum structurally and, and philosophically. You know, you come to to this place and you really walk in the the milieu of, of Mississippi's most famous visual artists and certainly what we call the most elusive visual artists in Mississippi. And Anderson, you know, he, he died in 1965 and it was born in 1903. So he lived an interesting in an interesting time period, things were changing. Modern life was was in, in introducing itself to his world, and so he fled out to the islands, the Barrier Islands uh, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, and really became enamored and in touch with the natural world. And so, when you come to this museum, you'll you'll see his bicycle that he he pedaled thousands of miles across the country. You'll see his skiff that he rode out to the islands, and you'll see all the wonderful works he made: watercolors and block prints and furniture, and all these different things. Huge murals that have have stood the test of time. And so it's really a story about resilience and the mystical qualities of Mississippi and the natural world. And it's one of a kind place for sure. And, and Anderson really does capture the imagination. And even when you walk outside the museum, everywhere I've been, um, institutions I've worked at as a museum, we try to break down those barriers between the galleries and the, the outside world. But here at this museum, it's just written into the very soul of the museum because Anderson himself uh, broke so many barriers. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a blessing to be here. And for folks who have been here before, I would just encourage you to, to know that it's always changing, just like nature, it reinvents itself. The, the works of art change, the stories change, but it gives us a really expansive lens to talk about not just nature and beautiful animals and sunsets, but about everything that grounds the history and, and future of, of Southern culture. Absolutely. You know, I think about that a lot about how 
you know, we do have barriers that we have to break down in, in whatever, you know, art form it is. My background's in theater and some people feel like they never want to walk into one because it's, you know, not accessible or they may think of museums for, you know, some, it, you know, somebody who has more education, more money, whatever it is. So I, I love, you know, talking about the accessibility of art and how, uh, how we can break down those barriers. So I would just love to hear some of your thoughts and, and methods or brainstorms on that. Yeah, for sure. It's something we've thought about. And since I started here in 2018, have started to execute. You know, certainly there's more work to be done, but I think this idea of accessibility, even the name museums is is steeped in this history of, mm -hmm. of prestige and exclusivity. And so, you know, part of being a Southern institution is meeting people where they are, and for us, you know, some of our most successful programs have been ones that directly engage the natural world and built upon the Anderson legacy. So, you know, a great example of this, there's a contemporary artist, Lonnie Holly, who was born mm -hmm. in, in uh, and lived in Birmingham, Alabama, now in, in Atlanta. He's in collections all over the, the world, but he was a self-taught African-American artist who largely uses found materials, things he found in, as he says, kind of the ditches and off the beaten paths of Birmingham, Alabama. And we brought him to the Mississippi Gulf Coast to go out to Horn Island with some students who had never, many of them never been on a boat and, and a lot of them had never been to the museum. And we took them out to Horn Island and created collaborative sculptures ultimately back on the mainland from things they sourced from the island. And so on, on its surface, you know, what does this more abstract sculptural tradition have to do with Anderson? But as you dig deeper and Lonnie Holly gave words to this, you know, he was doing in Birmingham in an urban environment, much what Anderson was doing during his lifetime, which is looking for the discarded, the things people didn't look at as mm -hmm. valuable and transforming those into art. And so that's a good example of what we try to do. And there's many other initiatives. We try to interface directly with, you know, cities and municipalities who were talking about creative placemaking or economic development. We've got a cool program in Pascagoula that's going on right now where we're using the expertise of, um, College and Career Technical Institute of the Pasigula Gauche School District and the welders there and the mach precision machine students and the business and marketing students. And they're going to be creating over the course of an entire year, um, large scale steel sculptures that will be permanently installed in their downtown as part of their revitalization efforts. So even that, you know, that, that those are things that Anderson, while it doesn't necessarily um, on the surface seem in tune, it very much philosophically is about looking differently at opportunities and landscapes and trying to innovate within them. And so those are some of the most exciting programs. And, and both of those examples are ones that happen outside of our walls. So mm. I think that's what people have to think about um, any cultural institution and really any nonprofit is, you know, you have to, of course, have a, a headquarters and, and for museums, it's so place-based and, and original object-based, but also to really engage and to create transformation you have to go forth. And that's something that we really enjoy doing and, and look forward to more opportunities to, to do so and all across the state. Have you found that when you, when you do have those programs outside of the walls of, of your own building, have you found that you attract a different type of community member or, or just more community members? Oh, sure. I mean, I think that's true. If you know, again, whatever field you're in, if you're just waiting for folks to come to you, you're going to have a certain clientele, but to go out and, and seek out um, communities who may not know about you, even um, you're, you're going to, you're going to find in that process, uh, much richer, um, you know, uh, learnings and, and impacts. Another program we did actually this summer, earlier this summer was called Space Between the Trees. Mm. And it's a, a longitudinal project to, uh, to try to influence public education in Mississippi through outdoor landscapes, outdoor teaching labs. How do we use you know, the, the natural world as a, a way to overlay on state standards and, and get people and get students outside of the classroom? So we were in the Mississippi Delta, took folks on the Mississippi River. We paddled out to an island with Quapaw Canoe Company uh, we oh, did wow. a whole series of, uh, of engagements in, in public lands, and they were interfacing with science and history and creative writing. And I don't think any of the students, or at least 80% of them, you know, had even known who Walter Anderson was. And that was almost mm -hmm. beside the point. Um, but learning from, from that process, when teachers were involved too, we were able to report back to the field and to the educational policymakers in Mississippi that if we, if we really think creatively, maybe there is a way that we can still 
uh, score score well on the tests, but also you know pay homage to the land itself and get students mm. excited about going outside and and the fear that we all have of going off the beaten path. Um, a lot of times, Absolutely. that's where the real magic happens. This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at five. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Join us each week for Everyday Tech on MPB Think Radio. We have an IT expert, a computer repair ace, and we troubleshoot your problems on the phones as well. Everyday Tech, Wednesdays at 10 on MPB Think Radio. Download the podcast now or listen on YouTube on the MPB Think Radio channel. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Leslie Barker, Arts-Based Community Development Director at the Mississippi Arts Commission. And today I'm talking with Julian Rankin about his work at the Walter Anderson Museum of Art and Art Museum Month Mississippi, which is happening right now. So Julian, tell us a little bit again about Arts, Art and Museum Month Mississippi. Yeah, so all, um, all month long for the entire month of August, uh, several of our Wonderful museums here in the state are offering free admission uh, to to all comers, and the, the initiative is really trying to ignite some some in state travel and and thank our communities for standing by us. So this, of course, is a statewide thing. Arts Commission has really helped uh, get this going with partnership from Visit Mississippi. So the Walter Anderson Museum of Art here in Ocean Springs and and nearby in Biloxi, the Oro O'Keefe Museum of Art, um, we're participating in, in the Delta in Greenwood, the Museum of the Mississippi Delta, and then in Cleveland at Delta State, the Matthew Sanders Sculpture Garden. Um, but you can also go over to Meridian and see the Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience or to Laurel and the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art. And then, of course, in Jackson, the Mississippi Museum of Art. So it's really a wonderful opportunity for folks to, to get in their car and, and hop off and, and uh, find some, some wonderful places to go. But to, to really, um, like I've said before, remember why Mississippi is such a dynamic arts and cultural community. Hmm. Well, what, a, what a great time to have like a late summer Mississippi road trip with this. So, so Julian, if you were going to, if you were going to go on a Mississippi road trip or tell, you know, someone who maybe wasn't familiar with the state, how would you, what would you plan? What would be on your ideal Mississippi road trip for this museum month? Yeah. I mean, it's certainly an, an impossible question, but um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, for in terms of overlaying on on these museums who are participating, you know, one place to start would be at the Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience in Meridian. So I'll just say, the, you know, they're a perfect gateway into Mississippi arts and culture. They cover, you know, art, visual art, music, um, obviously uh, culinary and literary. So it's a a good introduction, and and it's almost like a, a mini tour of the state in itself. You can actually get in a boat and and see some projections of, of Walter Anderson um, and or, or or others and kind of the bayous and the Gulf Coast. And so it's a way to, to tip your toe in the water, if you will. So if you're starting in Meridian, going through their galleries, and then you go out and, and actually see some of these places, maybe swing down to the Gulf Coast. And if you're in Ocean Springs or um, along coastal Mississippi, you know, you have to go down Highway 90, which is, you know, right on the beach. It's just, there's just something about driving in Mississippi and seeing the water. Some people don't mm -hmm. even know that we have coastal uh, Mississippi. And actually we call it the secret coast down here. And um, it's not that well kept of a secret anymore, but um, I'm not going to single out any, you know, too many uh, establishments, but it's certainly in Ocean Springs. Uh, one of my favorite restaurants is a place called Vestige. And um, it, it's so tied to locally sourced, but also the, the cultural commingling that happens from the chef who's from the South and who has a biology background, really interested in kind of the chemistry of food. And then his wife, who has a Japanese upbringing and heritage, and he's really attracted to the Japanese aesthetic and preparation techniques. And she loves Southern baking. So there's a, a place that I would, would certainly recommend if you're in Ocean Springs and going down to Biloxi, I'll just say another wonderful restaurant and chef in, in White Pillars. Um, but then going north, you know, when I, I lived in Jackson, I lived in Fondren, and that's a wonderful uh, little community to to be a part of and to shop in and to support. 
but also I really like downtown Jackson and, and seeing mm-hmm. Ferris Street and and walking the the steps of you know the civil rights movement and seeing revitalization happening. And there's a new museum to market trail in Jackson. You can get outside again and see the Pearl River, you know, carving through the city. So that's a, a wonderful a wonderful place to to be and to see. And then in the Delta, which you know. I can't say enough about the Delta in terms of its mystical quality. You can't really go wrong. Um, but I would just uh, really for, for folks to throw away the map in the Delta is what you what you really ought to do. Mm. You'll, you'll, you'll happen upon something interesting. Um, but also there, you know, you, you can, again, retrace important historical moments. You know, the Emmett Till Interpretive Center, for example, is one of those another institution that while they're not an art museum as part of this initiative, they're they're one of the treasures here in Mississippi. And then you can skip back over, you know, to, to, to Laurel. And if you're in Laurel, you know, we've been so fascinated from, from the coast to look up because if anyone knows about hometown, um, <laughs> the, you know, the HGTV show, which is of course filmed and, and shot in Laurel, they use a lot of Walter Anderson block prints there. And that's really transformed that town in a really interesting way. And it's a wonderful walking tour of a kind of a, a town that's continued, of course, to evolve and change and grow, but it's also got this, time capsule quality kind of inside of a, you know, an hourglass where you get to see these beautiful old houses. And then of course the Lauren Rogers museum, which is right there. So that's just a little snippet. I mean, I would say you can't go wrong anywhere. There's so much great food in Mississippi. There's so many institutions to see, but one of the things I've always thought is, um, you know, what makes Mississippi so great are the things that people, you know, don't know about or the things that aren't in the books because anywhere, Mm -hmm in this state, if you're, uh, if you're driving in your car and exploring, you really are the author of your own story. So that's what I would encourage folks to do. Maybe find a few places to start and then just let your imagination and let the road unfurl. I mean, that just sounds awesome. I think everybody needs to do, do that. That that's, you know, just listening to you talk about, it makes me, you know, get even more excited. I mean, we're already excited about the art in Mississippi, but just the culture and everything is just so exciting. So I want to talk a little bit about what what you've been up to at the Walter Anderson Museum. I know that you recently had a really exciting collaboration that was, you know, visual arts and music. So tell us all about that. Yeah. So, you know, with the support of the Mississippi Arts Commission and and others, we, we had a, you know, a concert experience that we've never done before. And it was part of a series that we have done before, but this year was completely different. And uh, the name of the series is Luther Dickinson's Music Inspired by the Seven Climates. And it's a long name, but the, the mm-hmm. seven climates actually comes from a Walter Anderson quote that he gave to a newspaper back in the 50s when he was painting the 3,000 square feet of murals in the Ocean Springs Community Center. And so this is a, you know, a muraled space that has all these different panels of the biodiversity of, of coastal Mississippi, but also myths and legends and just so much fun stuff to see. And it's really, uh, it vibrates with, with a music and orchestral score of itself. And so Luther Dickinson, who's a Grammy nominated musician and songwriter, people know him from many things. He's, he founded with his brother, the North Mississippi All-Stars. He's played with the Black Crows, but he walked into the museum some years ago and and saw and felt and heard the music on the walls. And so he started a concert series, this music inspired by the seven climates. And this year was our our fifth annual um, concert. We couldn't do it last year because of COVID and we timed it just right in, in May of this year where it worked out, but we still wanted to make it safe. And so we did it outdoors. And since we couldn't be in the community center where it's normally held, we took digital projections of Anderson's art had those animated and projected onto the outside surfaces of the museum. So the facade of the building was alive with the, the artwork, almost like you turned the museum inside out and the art was, was on the, on the walls. And then Luther with his, his, um, his extended family of Southern players, which ex- included Mardi Gras Indians from new Orleans and, you know, Mississippi Hill country blues and jazz and funk, all these different uh, musicians and performers representing all these different, Southern cultural traditions, they performed an amazing street party. And uh, we had a wonderful crowd and everyone felt safe and it was a beautiful sunset. You know, the temperature was just right. And so it really was a transformative experience to take what started as a, an homage to the, the murals in a, in a more uh, kind of intimate setting and really blow it out. And it was one of the first events that, you know, we had been able to have down here, um, you know, since COVID. And I think people really were able to, to use it as a release, as a cathartic experience to, again, reacquaint themselves with 
the, the dynamism and the vibrancy of Southern culture and all these different cultural traditions that were mixing and melding through the music. And to have the projections outside was just something that I know down here, a lot of folks had never seen. The photos are absolutely incredible. I mean, I, I am so sad that I missed it. If you guys ever decide to, to, to do that again, I will be there. Like I said, it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, and, you know, I, I lived in Memphis for a long time and I'm very close to the North Mississippi All-Stars where they live. So I got, they were always playing in Memphis. And, you know, you're absolutely right. It is a street party when they play. I mean, they just like, you know, they march through the audience with drums and have a billion different, you know, people on stage. I mean, it's, it's so much fun. So I can only imagine. Um, so did you notice that people, especially coming out of, you know, this year of quarantine, um, did you notice that people were just really excited to be witnessing art again? Yeah, I mean, it's it was definitely true. And, you know, I think one of the, the underlying things about any artistic medium and, and tradition, whether we're talking about, you know, food or, or visual art or theater, you know, it brings people together and it, it creates a, a sound bed, if you will, for people to connect and to interact. And especially given that so many of us have not seen our friends and neighbors for so long, it really was an opportunity to do that. And you could sense it, you can feel it in the air. And it helped again, having the weather be nice. It was just, you know, like the universe had had collaborated with us to give us, you know, a moment to, to see beyond, you know, what had been a, a very insular and isolating period of time. And just to connect it back to Anderson, you know, he, when he was out on the island, he was isolated, but he, he sought this solitude in the name of unity, you know, and he, of course, mm. saw himself in the animals as well, even though he wasn't around people, he, he did feel like he had a community of animals. But, you know, this idea that there's a, a, a paradox that's always at play, this separateness and this connectedness, and so this was the, the, the Luther Dickinson concert was really um, that connectedness in, in all its, its um, you know, the, the nth degree. And people, again, came out all different ages. You had kids running around and, and you know, people coming in from out of state and, and really all here in the streets, blocking the street off. And the murals, the Walter Anderson murals in the community center were even made as a, an act of civic obligation as well. They were done for the grand sum of a dollar, a check he never cashed famously. And so all of that collaboration and all of that history, that legacy um, stacking up against each other, given the context of, as you mentioned, quarantine and a pandemic, it, it created an opportunity for us to do what we felt and, and feel as, a, as an act of community service, which is to put on you know, engagements and events that activate the art um, in new ways, as we talked about in the first segment, and uh, we really will always look back at that event as one of the most successful ones uh, we've had. And it, it, it's gonna spur some, some new and different and um, other re iterations of that same kind of thing, I think in the future. And so we're already planning to, to see where we can take that. Oh, that's so exciting. So I might've missed that one, but I'll be, I'll be on the lookout for the next one. I'm very excited about that. This is Leslie Barker. Thanks for listening to the podcast version of the Mississippi Arts Hour. The show airs on MPB Think Radio every Sunday afternoon at 5. To access all of our past shows, subscribe to the Mississippi Arts Hour podcast using your favorite podcasting app. Hello, I'm Dr. Nancy Lotridge anderson president of New Perspectives, a fee-only financial advising firm and co-host of Money Talks. For over 10 years, Money Talks has been answering your personal financial questions and sharing knowledge about money management. Money Talks can be heard Tuesdays at 9 a.m. on MPB Think Radio. Podcasts can be found on our website, money.mpbonline.org, or on your smart device's podcasting platform. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. You're listening to the Mississippi Arts Hour on MPB Think Radio. I'm Leslie Barker from the Mississippi Arts Commission, and today I'm speaking with multimedia storyteller Julian Rankin. So, Julian, you know, I, I love hearing about your work at the Walter Anderson Museum, and I'm definitely excited to talk even more about our, you know, Museum Month in Mississippi, but I also want to hear about 
just your work as an artist like tell, tell us about what you do yeah well you know i'm i'm uh I used to not, not even want to call myself a writer back when I was younger. I knew I wanted to be one, but I, I felt like an imposter saying it. So I don't even know that, you know, an, an artist, it's, it's hard to call yourself an artist sometimes, but certainly, is, yeah. you, you know, I'm a, I try to be a storyteller and, and I've found, you know, uh, as, as I've tried to discover what my lane was that, you know, telling the stories of, of real people and real things um, has always it's always fascinated me and it really has become what I love to do. So, you know, just to give you a little background. I, I grew up, as I mentioned, in a, a very culturally rich place, a lot of writers around and, and, um, you know, fell in love with this notion, this romantic notion of kind of being a novelist as we all do. And maybe I'll write a novel someday, but, you know, I found in college that while I was not that great of a fiction writer, I, um, I, I was really enamored and, and, came through some wonderful professors to understand the power of creative nonfiction. And so a lot of what I do, I love the idea of, of reportage and documentary work and archival work and, and, and really the multimedia uh, possibilities of that. And of course I, I have written a lot. I mean, I've got a, you know, in, in 18, 2018, um, I wrote a book and came out, it was published called Catfish Dream, which is a, um, a book that was published by the University of Georgia Press as part of an imprint that the Southern Foodways Alliance has with them. And that was about a entrepreneurial African-American catfish farmer in the Mississippi Delta. And so that's the the book I wrote. And have, and that that's taken me a lot of places and allowed me to to do a lot of things. And, and then from there, I've certainly continued to write for magazines and contribute to other collections and anthologies. But I'm really um, in my my museum job, everyday job, trying to continue to stretch and think about how can I combine photography, video, audio, you know, I love podcasting and certainly have some work on my own producing and, and making and recording podcasts, but also, again, just this idea of, of capturing as much as we can, the raw material, and then figuring mm -hmm. out how to repurpose that. And so much of that can um, can be done just as we walk down the street. Um, one one good example, and, and again, it is so much connected to my my work here because this museum has given me the opportunity to fit myself within my day job, which is a wonderful blessing. But in 2019, you know, we took a, a canoe trip to Horn Island, and Horn Island's you know a dozen miles offshore. The again, Anderson's Eden, the place where he went and really found transcendence. But we took a 29 foot Voyager canoe, this Voyager style of canoe that was the same that the 18th century fur traders would traverse the Great Lakes with. And uh, it was captained by John Ruskey, who's another Mississippi mm. legend, uh, evangelist of the Mississippi mm -hmm. River, as he's been called. And so a crew of us went out there and camped for six days. So we, we rode all the way to Horn Island. It takes quite a while and then camped for six days. And I was able to um, as I was there, be working on some work for Oxford American magazine. And uh, what came of that was a 7,000 word essay and a podcast and a short film. And that was just a, it's, it's a good example of how I like to work and the things that I really find passion in. It's in that case, leading a museum program, but finding a way to use audio, video, and, mm. and, and literary um, technique and words, the written word. Um, to give a more, a fuller uh, experience to what I had seen. And I think for all of us, you know, the, at least for those like myself, it, it, in documentary work, it's very rare that you can give someone the true experience of what you saw and what you felt. Um, there's something about the real seeing and feeling the moment that's very hard to capture. And that's why art exists. It's all mm -hmm. across time, people trying to record what it is that they felt and saw in, in a given space in a moment of time. But, um, but I, for me, I think multimedia work is an opportunity to do that. Even if I can't crack the code and write some, you know, uh, American uh, classic novel that, that captures everything I want to say about existence and humanity, at least I can use um, photography and video and audio and, and writing to give different viewpoints and different ways of seeing um, an experience that is so multifaceted and that experience that's so multifaceted is, is what's happening every day of our lives, every moment of our lives. If, and if we choose to capture it, um, I think then we're artists. You know, I, I think that that so speaks to our, our time that we're living in now too, is, is using different, um, you know, different forms of media. Have you found that um, people you know, different people relate to those different forms and that it makes it more accessible in a way? 
Yes. And I think that's is a larger point that any of us who work in, in nonprofit worlds or, or art worlds or business worlds, and for that matter, is that people's appetites and, and ways of consuming things have, have changed so dramatically. And perhaps they're always changing. I guess there was probably a time when, you know, I guess, yeah, video killed the radio star, right? Or the <laughs> yeah. gramophone or whatever it might be. And, and people just consume things differently now. And whether that's a platform, a publishing platform, or a way of, of putting something out where you're, you know, embedding together, weaving together uh, photo and video and, and text. But I find it in my, in my own consumption is that, you know, I often say I'm a horrible English major because I don't mm-hmm. read as much as I should. Um, but I do find myself listening to a lot more history through podcasts or, you know, con- uh, being a cultural consumer in, in other ways. And so, yeah, I think, I, I think as, um, as artists or as communicators, as marketers, whatever you might be, um, it, it's a constant curve. There's that razor's edge of trying to figure out not just what is the the marketplace, but you know what how what best serves and how do I want to best tell um, my story. And we're we're so fortunate to have the leveling of the playing field where a lot of these tools are are here for all of us to use. And uh, for a place like Mississippi, um, you know, which is for so so much of time and not had all the resources and infrastructure mm-hmm. of larger places you know, we've always had the wealth of storytellers and story. And so combine Mm -hmm. that with the tools that we have at our disposal. And it's why there's so much great work uh, coming out of this state. What are, what are some of your influences or just types of things that you're drawn to as, you know, as a consumer of art? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, that's, it's tough. I mean, if, if I think about, you know, growing up in the place that I did in, in terms of words, you know, I love the, the, the Larry Brown is, you know, mm-hmm. we, we were, we were friends with Larry Brown. And for those who don't know, you know, Larry Brown, the late Larry Brown from outside of Oxford, Mississippi in Yakna. Um, he's the originator of grit lit, you know, this idea mm-hmm. of this more democratic populist um, vehicle for the people that he saw at the convenience store or at the bar or at the farm. And, um, a, a great example, and there's obviously many who have their own viewpoints, but a great example of speaking to what you know and and giving a mouthpiece to those who didn't have one. Um, Kiese Lehman, who's mm-hmm. you know obviously a, a celebrated uh, Mississippian, um, a similar thing. You know, where do you where where do I come from? What is not being told about my experience? And that's where great work comes from. Um, and so, that in, in the literary world, I would I would of course tag those, but you know you can't say much about Mississippi literature without going to Jasmine Ward or Natasha mm. Trethewey. And, and there's too many to name. And I do find though, just a more on a lighter note, just the way I consume things, I'm really uh, attracted these days to, you know, you can call it edutainment, but it's this idea mm-hmm. that, you know, we can talk about serious issues and, and give meaning to things, but in a comical, humorous or lighthearted way, not to make light of them, but to make them, um, to demystify them and to make them a little, uh, more approachable. And so uh, in the podcast I listen to, for example, uh, you know, I love, you know, the, the ones that examine popular culture with, with the lens of, of a larger historical context, for example. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, that just as a a broad category of, of ways that, that this happens. Um, but that's just to say that I think when we just speaking, taking it back to a museum professional's perspective, you know, the more that we can move people and impact people and give resonance to the stories we're telling, so that we're not saying, take this vitamin, read this story, it's good for you, but more more attracting them to the story we're telling by making it relevant and um, and enjoyable and something that, you know, they they feel like is, is indispensable to them. And things do have to be fun. We live in a world that has enough of, you know, the things we need to do to, to survive and to be healthy and to make it through the day. The more that we can make things that give people escape and that, you know, creates edification um, that that they can find and that they want to find. That's only going to strengthen our institutions and and the stories that we're telling. Absolutely. So I I just would love to hear like in in your words what it is that draws you to museums because you know we are gonna we'll give you that list again in a minute of the museums you can visit for free. But you know why why go to a museum in today's world? Right. Well, I was um, I was told by one of my mentors, uh, Betsy Bradley, at the Mississippi Museum of Art, and and this is true of all museums, of course. But 
you know, when we're in an art museum, we're always taking it back to the original object. You know, we're mm -hmm. a collecting institution. We have these things we show, um, you know, they're on the walls. We need to preserve them. So much of our work is about keeping these artifacts safe for the next generation. But when I, um, when I came into museums, um, not to keep saying it's all about story, but I was really fascinated with how to activate these objects. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, these all have their own history and provenance. Um, but when, when a new person, whether it's myself or a visitor, when, they, when we come to an object, you know, or an exhibition or any place, we're bringing with it all of our own experience and it changes mm -hmm. the meaning of that thing. So the meaning making behind and beyond the object in a museum is what really fascinates me. And I think all these museums on our list, you know, that we've, uh, that we're talking about today that are all offering free admission, whether that's the Mississippi Arts and Entertainment Experience in Meridian, or I'm going to list them here, the Lauren Rogers Museum of Art in Laurel, or in the Delta, the Matthew Sanders Sculpture Garden, and the Museum of the Mississippi Delta, and the Mississippi Museum of Art, which I, I just referenced, or down here on the coast, our museum, the Walter Anderson Museum, or the or O'Keefe Museum, you know, all of these places have objects, and um, mm -hmm. you'll find when you go to them, all those objects have been reinterpreted as new staff members come on, but also as new visitors come in, as new issues in our contemporary landscape change. And the best museums, and I think Mississippi has some of the best museums, are ones that um, are flexible and that understand that the object's meaning does not stay static, that it continues to evolve and, um, and re, uh, rebirth and reinvent itself as the people around it, as the communities around it, as the societies around it change and evolve as well. And so that's why I love museums. And you know, I think that's why um, any place in Mississippi is is uh, an amazing place. That's why there is so much promise in the future is because all of us and all the artists who are around us can continue to um, to make meaning that is true to the past, but is um, breaks forth from that, that container and, and does some things that we can't even imagine. The flourishing of the future is is precisely because things don't stay the same. We have power to change them. Mm. Uh, that's that's a beautiful answer. That's wonderful. And, and right now is the perfect time for, for people to find out for themselves how they feel about museums, because as we've been talking about, it is Art Museum Month in Mississippi. And all of those museums that Julian just mentioned, you can visit for free. How do they do that? How do people go about visiting these museums for free? So through a partnership with Visit Mississippi, you just go to their website. That's visitmississippi.org slash art museums. And then all you'll really do is, is put your email address in and you'll get an email back that'll give you free admission to all these institutions we've named across the state. And uh, this is being fueled by the Mississippi Arts Commission who does so much great work to, uh, to make these events like Luther Dickinson happen that we talked about earlier, but mm -hmm. also just to keep these museums and institutions operating. And so the last time, you know, I'll, I'll kind of say it all, but you know, this is a way of us coming together as institutions um, reaffirming that Mississippi matters, that our, our art is some of the best that ever was made, and also that we wanted to give back to the communities who have stood by us during this difficult time. And, um, and maybe it's a way for us all to come together, whether, whether that's in your little family group, or maybe you'll meet some new friends on the road. But either way, there's a wonderful opportunity this month for folks to get out there and, and go see some things you haven't seen before. This is probably an impossible question, but do you have a favorite piece at the museum that you want everybody to see at, at the Walter Anderson Museum? Yeah, I mean, the easy answer, and um, we, we talked about this off mic, but the, the Ocean Springs Community Center is the most public work and the grandest work that Anderson ever made, and it's 3,000 square feet of murals. So you, have, you do have to see that, and it's what people, many people who come here know. But the cool thing about our museum is it's architecturally connected to that community center. And on the other end of the museum is the most private work he ever made, another mural, which is the Little Room. Mm -hmm. The Little Room was a, a private space that was discovered after Anderson's death, never ending day, all this color and shape and form. And so that's um, kind of a spiritual experience in itself. So those, mm -hmm. two, um, those two bookended murals are what I would direct people toward. Thanks for listening to this MPB Think Radio podcast. MPB depends on support from listeners, so if you can, please contribute today at mpbonline.org. 
Southern Remedies, Relatively Speaking, is a show that explores issues that relate to you and your family. To find out what we're all about, subscribe to the podcast by using any podcast app 